Andrew Carnegie is regarded as one of the richest businessmen in modern history. He is also called the father of modern philanthropy by many because of his charitable donations, but most of us are unaware of the shockingly cruel and evil business practices that helped Carnegie amass his fortune. In this video, we will uncover the dark side of Carnegie's career and will also shed light on his philanthropy. This will help you make an informed decision on whether Carnegie is a saint or a sinner. To get a better understanding of Carnegie's business practices, let's dive into Andrew Carnegie's early life first. Carnegie was born on 25th November 1835 in Dunfermline, an ancient town that once enjoyed the privilege of being Scotland's capital during the medieval times. However, as they say, good things don't last. The inhabitants of Dunfermline were going through tough times economically, with high unemployment rates and widespread poverty. Carnegie's mother used to work day and night to make ends meet, whereas his father was a weaver, a career that Carnegie was expected to pursue as well. His father, William, had little idea about how to adapt during the Industrial Revolution, and his handloom business became obsolete. His father's struggle and rapid decline had a traumatic effect on Andrew, who became determined to provide his family with a comfortable life. In 1848, when Andrew was just 13 years old, the Carnegies sold all of their possessions and borrowed a sum of 20 pounds from a friend and moved to Pittsburgh in pursuit of the American dream. However, things didn't go as planned, as Andrew's parents struggled to find employment in Pittsburgh as well. Out of options, Andrew had to give up on his education and seek employment opportunities to support his family. Despite facing numerous rejections, Andrew was determined to seek employment and kept on hustling until finally landing a job at the local telegraph office. Carnegie made it his mission to build connections in the local business fraternity by going over and above his job's basic requirements. The young Carnegie did this by memorizing the names, addresses, as well as landmarks near the houses of the people he was delivering the telegrams to. He would often greet them personally while delivering telegraphs or whenever he crossed them on the streets. He was slowly getting where he wanted to be, but this was just the beginning. However, the skill that landed Andrew his big break was his ability to instantly decipher and recite the telegram by simply hearing the Morse code. His conviction and talent soon caught the eye of Thomas Scott, a regional manager for the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. Scott soon hired Carnegie as his personal telegrapher and private secretary for a sum of $35 per month. Scott would often affectionately refer to Andrew as my boy Andy, and their bond strengthened over time with Scott becoming a father figure and guide to Carnegie. This was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for Carnegie, who was about to sit in the driver's seat and observe the subtle art of running a business as big as the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, which was, at the time, the largest corporation on the planet. He quickly rose through the ranks at the Pennsylvania Railroad Company and soon succeeded Scott as the superintendent of the Pittsburgh division. He started investing in the stock market on Scott's advice, and that was the time Andrew realized the power of money and capitalism. This was just the beginning of Carnegie's epic rags-to-riches journey, which would soon take him to the pinnacle of the business world. During the American Civil War, Scott was bestowed with the responsibility of military transportation for the North, and Carnegie played an instrumental role in executing this responsibility, managing key roles in the operation. Andrew even escaped serving the military during the Civil War by paying $850 to an Irish immigrant to serve as his substitute in the army. It wasn't that Carnegie was afraid of serving in the army, but the opportunity cost was too high and his growth in the business world was at stake. His decision to pay for a substitute instead made the difference. While the Civil War was a horrifying event for many, for Andrew, it was a goldmine of opportunities. The fragile nature of the wooden bridges and their vulnerability to being burnt down by the enemy troops meant that there was a need to replace wooden bridges with metallic bridges. This pushed the demand for iron to an all-time high. The Civil War thus served as the catalyst for the growth of the iron industry. Andrew was determined to seize this opportunity and he knew that the stakes were high, but the potential was endless. 
So, in 1865, Andrew resigned from his job at Pennsylvania Railroad Company and founded the Keystone Bridge Company with a motive to replace fragile wooden bridges with the more durable iron ones. By 1866, Carnegie was already making $50,000 annually, which grew to a whopping $400,000 by 1868 because of Carnegie's exceptional business strategy. All of Carnegie's competitors that were manufacturing iron bridges relied on iron mill owners for their raw materials. But Andrew knew that if he wanted to dominate this industry, he would have to have total control of the production process. And that was only possible if he owned his own iron mill. After starting his own iron mill, Andrew's next target was the iron rail industry. Railroads were the most prevalent form of transportation back then and an extremely lucrative business to enter. He was able to create synergy between the three arms of his company. If you are enjoying this video, please subscribe to our channel, Business Absolute. Success often comes at a heavy price. Andrew's wealth came at the price of his mental peace, something that impacted him so much that he had made up his mind to retire in the next two years at a mere age of 35. Carnegie, in a letter that he wrote to himself, said, To continue much longer, overwhelmed by business cares and with most of my thoughts wholly upon the way to make more money in the shortest time, must degrade me beyond hope of permanent recovery. I will resign from business at 35. But during the ensuing two years, I wish to spend the afternoons in receiving instruction and in reading systematically. This would later become a part of the Gospel of Wealth by Andrew Carnegie. However, what he eventually did was far from what he had said he would do after two years, as he continued to ruthlessly grow his business empire and mint large amounts of money for almost three decades. Two years after the much-talked-about letter of his retirement plans at 35, the tycoon stumbled upon a new steel refining process formulated by Englishman Henry Bessemer to convert iron into steel, a better alternative to the then-popular brittle iron. Steel has more carbon as compared to brittle iron, and thus it can withstand more pressure and was perfect for industries like railroads, construction, and heavy machinery. One of Carnegie's biggest assets was his ability to identify changing trends, predict future demand, and then go all in to make the most of the opportunities presented to him. In 1875, Carnegie invested his own money heavily and even borrowed a large sum of money to start a new steel plant in Pittsburgh called the Edgar Thompson Steelworks. Carnegie was a shrewd salesman, and that reflected in his naming of his company after one of his prime clients, J. Edgar Thompson, a railroad tycoon in the late 1800s. This helped Carnegie get in the good books of Thompson and secure more orders at better prices. Carnegie would soon meet the man who would end up playing a pivotal role in executing his shady business practices in the future. In 1881, Carnegie met Henry Clay Frick when the latter was on his honeymoon in New York City. Frick was an industrialist and the owner of the H.C. Frick & Company, who were into the production of coke, a coal-based fuel with high carbon content. The meeting was quite a fruitful one, as both Carnegie and Frick entered into a partnership that would supply Carnegie's steel mills with adequate supply of the fuel as when needed. On the other hand, Frick became the chairman of the Carnegie Steel Company and started the relentless expansion of the Carnegie Steel Empire. Often, the growth and expansion came at the cost of poor working conditions for laborers and low wages, with revolts being suppressed constantly with Frick in power. Carnegie Steel Companies was often accused of exploiting laborers amidst harsh working conditions and inadequate payments with the constant reduction of wages to cut down the operational costs. Carnegie was infamous for making his employees work 364 days a year. They were only given the 4th of July as a vacation. Even though he worked his employees to the bone, he would grab the first opportunity to upgrade his machinery if it meant that the new technology would reduce the number of workers required to complete a particular process. Carnegie and Frick's evil business practices were not restricted to his workers. He was ruthless in dealing with and destroying his competitors as well. One such example of their evil business strategy was how the dangerous duo spread a rumor about their competitor, Duquesne Steelworks. They started alleging that Duquesne produced low-grade steel which lacked homogeneity. They used technical jargon on purpose to confuse the buyers and instill a sense of fear in them. 
He wanted to run his competitor to the ground, and he sped up the process by lowering the price of his products to attract Duquesne's already scared customers. Duquesne couldn't survive this and ended up selling his company to Carnegie at a bargain in less than two years. Carnegie was getting away with his exploitative policies for almost a decade, with Frick acting as his enforcer and crushing any opposition or revolts by the workers. The steel industry had become an extremely hazardous industry, with one in ten steel workers dying on the job in the 1890s. However, things had reached the boiling point in 1892. Carnegie had directed Frick to increase production in the factory in Homestead and at the same time reduce the wages of the workers. The steel workers were enraged with the decision and started unionizing and protesting the unfair decrease in pay and unacceptably long working hours. Carnegie was trying to mend his image of being a crony capitalist and decided to avoid being directly involved in solving the issue surrounding the labor strike. He gave Frick a free hand to bring the situation under control, by hook or by crook. Frick started by throwing out the workers who dared to raise a voice against the management and replace them by bringing in hundreds of immigrants from third world countries who were ready to work for a lower pay. He then locked up union leaders and hired thugs to intimidate those who dared to go on strike. Frick called his army of armed mercenaries the Pinkertons. 300 Pinkertons reached the iron mill in Homestead with arms and ammunition and were met with an angry mob of over 10,000 workers who refused to go empty the Homestead iron mill. What started out as a strike ended as a massacre. Nine factory workers and seven Pinkertons lost their lives and hundreds were injured in what is considered one of the darkest days of Carnegie's long and illustrious business career. Carnegie's influence meant that he had a lot of powerful friends in the government, one of them being the governor of Pennsylvania who helped bail him out of this tough situation. The governor ordered 8,000 military personnel to go to the factory and defuse the situation. The military also helped bring order to the factory and made the workers restart work with the same terms of employment, lower pay and longer hours. Carnegie faced little to no consequences and by the end of the 19th century, his companies were producing more steel than the overall production capacity of Great Britain. With the dawn of the new century, the legendary banker John Pierpont Morgan, popularly known as J.P. Morgan, entered the picture. J.P. Morgan's Federal Steel Company started challenging Carnegie's steel empire. Carnegie was confident that he could trump the banker financier, but at the same time, Carnegie was not willing to devote another 10 to 15 years of his life into this, as he was already 64 by then and wanted to spend the rest of his life with his wife, Louise, and daughter, Margaret. So, in 1901, Carnegie wrote the price for his steel empire on a piece of paper and got it delivered to Morgan via one of his managers. And guess what? Morgan accepted it without a second thought, buying Carnegie's steel empire for a whopping $480 million. The deal added $250 million to Carnegie's personal wealth, making him the richest man in the world at the time. After retirement, Andrew was almost a changed man and made it his life's mission to give back to society. Often heard saying that the man who dies rich dies disgraced, Andrew Carnegie devoted his old age to philanthropy. He wanted to help people help themselves, and most of his donations went into skill development for the underprivileged and poor. He built more than 2,500 libraries all across the world and even extended a helping hand to educational institutions to make higher learning accessible to the masses. Carnegie donated more than $3 million to help build the Carnegie Institute of Technology, which later merged with Mellon University to form the world-renowned Carnegie Mellon University. Carnegie had spent $55 million building libraries and educational institutions, which he considered as the cornerstone for the growth of society. Carnegie was influential in the formation of the League of Nations and wanted to build a palace of peace that would evolve over time into an international court to maintain peace and harmony across the globe. However, his hopes for a world that lives in harmony were shattered with the onset of World War I, with his wife Louise mentioning that her husband's heart was broken, with the casualties and hostilities going around. Considered as the father of modern philanthropy, 
Carnegie had given away $350 million to philanthropic activities by the time of his death in 1919. Carnegie gave away more than 90% of his fortune to make the world a better place for me, for you, and for our future generations. But do you think that Carnegie's philanthropy makes up for his exploitative business practices? If you are enjoying this video, please subscribe to our channel, Business Absolute. Check out this video we recently made exposing another evil American tycoon.